Hi, welcome back to another week of universal algebra and lattice theory. So today we are going to get into a little more detail here with homomorphisms, subalgebras, and products of algebras. And so just as soon as I can get my drawing tools to cooperate with me here, then we will be able to get started. Okay, here we go. So, okay, so today I would like to discuss, uh, first of all, doing some preparatory work where we eliminate some indices which are both very useful to us in math and also sometimes the bane of our existence. Uh, and then I'll move on to talking about homomorphisms and how we can use those to associate monoids and groups to a given algebra. Then I'll talk about subalgebras and their corresponding subuniverses. I will then move on to products, I'm taking products of families of algebras, after which I'll sort of sum up those three topics by discussing the operators H, S, and P associated to homomorphisms, subalgebras, and products. And then finally, I'll discuss the topic of generating subalgebras from a subset of our universe. So we previously noted that most of our basic concepts only make sense for algebras of the same similarity type row taking our index set i to the whole numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, and so forth. So what we're going to do, since we really are only going to be talking about homomorphisms from an algebra to a similar algebra, or products of similar algebras, and so forth, we're going to fix our index set to actually be a collection, calligraphic f, of operation symbols, and then for each operation symbol, we're going to give that symbol a similarity type, which is given by a function rho from f to w, similar to what we did before, no pun intended. Uh, we can then express an algebra as a set along with the set f superscript a, where each little f superscript a is a row of f area operation on the universe A. So note that a particular little f in our collection of operation symbols is just taken as an abstract symbol with a specified arity. So this is similar to how uh, if I'm talking about addition in rings, then this symbol by itself doesn't really refer to a particular operation. We might think of it as referring to addition in the integers, for instance, like where we would have 2 plus 3 is equal to 5 in the integers. However, it could also refer to 2 plus 3 equals 0 in the quotient ring z mod 5z. And so we use this symbol plus for both of these operations, but we think of the first one as being plus interpreted in the algebra, which is the ring of integers. And the second one is being interpreted in z mod 5z, which if I tried, I could probably squeeze up here in the superscript, but I won't for the moment. In either case, we see that the arity of this operation is always going to be two, because we always think of plus as combining two things together. So, uh, just as we do for this plus sign when we think about rings, we can do that in general for operation symbols. And as you can imagine, uh, it would get really tedious to have a different symbol entirely for the addition operation of every different ring which we considered. And so it will similarly help us a lot to have just one symbol for each basic operation uh, for a given uh, class of algebras that we're considering. So for example, we can focus our attention on the similarity type of rings 
by fixing operation symbols A, M, N, and Z of Arides 2, 2, and 1, and 0, respectively. We think of these operation symbols as representing addition, multiplication, negation, or taking the additive inverse, and the zero constant or null area operation of the ring. Now, of course, these symbols and their arities by themselves don't specify that we're talking about rings, but we want to consider the similarity type of rings, those algebras which have the same signature as rings. Given a particular ring R and two elements A and B in R, we would then write M superscript R of AB to indicate the product of A and B in the ring R. N to the R of A would indicate the additive inverse of A in the ring R, and so forth. And so this is a slightly more general example of the very specific one I gave before of addition in the integers as opposed to in another ring like C mod 5C. Okay, so we can use um, Oh, and so of course when context allows, just as I did before, uh, we'll write M of AB rather than M superscript R of AB when it's clear which ring we're talking about. Usually when I write just 2 plus 3 without specifying the ring, then it's assumed that we're talking about the integers or perhaps some ring which contains the integers. Uh, and so I don't need to actually specify that this is happening in the integers here because that's a concept, uh, that comes from the context. That's something which we can just take from the general mathematical context in which we're working. So uh, as I've already been doing, actually, we can use similar notation for infix symbols, like the plus sign. So for yet another example, a uh, dot superscript, this ring, b, uh, may be used instead of saying m superscript R of AB. And just as before, the superscript may be dropped when we know what ring we're talking about. Okay. So now that we've eliminated an extra collection of indices, no more big I running around with its little FIs following after it, we, um, we can get back to talking about homomorphisms. So we had this previous definition of a homomorphism of algebras, where we did have an index set I um, and a corresponding similarity type rho, taking that index set to the whole numbers. And then we defined a homomorphism like this. Now, of course, this is, this is the definition and is totally valid, but with our new notation, we have a slightly cleaner way of saying it. Now we say, given algebras A and B, whose uh, basic operations are the interpretation of those operation symbols F in A and the interpretation of those operation symbols F in B. So we're tacitly assuming here that these algebras have the same similarity type in addition to having the same basic operation symbols. We say that a function H from A to B is a homomorphism when for each basic operation symbol now, and whose arity we can say is some N, some whole number N, and all uh, collections of N little A's in our universe A, we have that, well, the same condition, which Again, although I've, I think I've gestured it with my hands before, but I haven't actually drawn the picture, we can think of this that if we're in the algebra A over here and in the algebra B over here, then what this is saying is that if I have A1, A2, blah, 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 up to An, if I have these, if I have these elements here, then I can either combine these elements into a new one. We can combine these guys all together according to, according to F interpreted in here to get a new element. And then I can send that element over to B 
by using H. So that will give me one thing in B. Or I can send each of these guys over to H by themselves and take H of A1, H of A2, and so forth up through H of AN. And then I can take each of these guys who came over all by themselves and combine them according to F in B in order to get another element. Now, if these two elements are actually the same thing for every possible choice of F and all possible choices of these A1, A2, up through AN, if these two guys are always the same, that's what it means to have a homomorphism. So maybe a more succinct way to say it is that you can either combine and then head over, or you can head over separately and combine over there. If no matter which way you do it, you get the same thing, then that's what it means to have a homomorphism. Okay, and so we already did introduce this concept before, but this notation hopefully makes it a little clearer that uh, we're using something that we want to think of as the same sort of operation, f in A and f in B, which happens to be taking place in two different algebras. It's not literally the same operation, but we want to think of f A and f B as being two different interpretations of the same symbol. Now we're going to give some basic terminology pertaining to homomorphisms. Uh, much of this will parallel what you may have already seen for groups or rings. Um, other things will be new. So we refer to injective homomorphisms as embeddings. Not much new there, probably. When H is a surjective homomorphism from A to B, we say that B is a homomorphic image of A. This is something that I think is a little more unique to uh, universal algebra. I'm not sure in elementary abstract algebra how many I uh, mean, people often talk about homomorphic images. Maybe they do, and I just don't remember. But in any case, it's certainly language which is used in universal algebra all the time. A bijective homomorphism is said to be an isomorphism. That's also pretty standard. A homomorphism H from an algebra A to itself is called an endomorphism. The collection of all endomorphisms of an algebra is denoted by end A. Similarly, an isomorphism, H taking A to itself, is called an automorphism. The set of all automorphisms of A is denoted by ot A. Well, now we're going to actually make some use of uh, these collections in order to associate new algebraic structures to the old ones that we already had. Okay, so first of all, note that if G is a homomorphism from an algebra A to an algebra B, and H is a homomorphism from an algebra B to an algebra C, then H composed with G, that function, is actually a homomorphism from the algebra A to the algebra C. So I'm being a little, little uh, curt here maybe when I say that H composed with G is a homomorphism, Naturally, you should say a homomorphism from what to what, because of course, H composed with G. Initially, we just know it's a function, but it's actually true that H composed with G, that function is a homomorphism from the algebra A to the algebra C, no matter which homomorphisms H and G we choose. Okay, so that will be important to us right now because if we have an algebra A and we look at the collection of all of its endomorphisms equipped with the usual composition of functions and the identity function from A to itself as the identity, then we'll see that we actually have an algebra which is a monoid. So not just an algebra, but actually a monoid the endomorphism monoid of our algebra A. And so uh, we can associate to any algebra this monoid. And similarly, we can actually associate to any algebra A at all, no matter what it is, a group 
The universe of that group is the set of all automorphisms of the algebra A. The binary operation is again function composition. The inversion is nothing but the usual inverse function because remember every member of uh, A is a bijection and has a corresponding inverse function which happens to also itself uh, be an automorphism if the original function was an automorphism. And finally the identity is still the identity map or identity automorphism of A. Okay, so if we start off with any algebra at all, we see that actually, even though we didn't at the outset necessarily look for this to happen, every algebra, no matter how wild or unusual it is, has two very familiar algebraic structures associated to it, namely a monoid, it's endomorphism monoid, and a group, it's automorphism group. And so uh, kind of a recurring theme that will happen is that we'll see that algebraic structures which initially appear to us as the natural and basic ones to study actually come into our study of more general algebraic structures in uh, more abstract ways, such as being associated to uh, these structures formed by the homomorphisms from an algebra to itself. And so we'll see the similar type of pattern occur with lattices as well later on for some to give some foreshadowing there. So we refer to an algebra whose universe consists of a single element as a trivial algebra. So a trivial algebra has a universe which has only a single element, say A, and some collection of basic operations F. And so it's not hard to see actually that there's basically only A trivial algebra, a single one, up to isomorphism because there aren't very many n area operations one can define on a singleton set whose element is just this one single thing. All right, so the reason I just abruptly switched gears to talk about trivial algebras is because I want to say that we call an algebra A rigid when its automorphism group is a trivial algebra. And so if you've already seen uh, trivial groups in group theory, the definition I just gave is a generalization of that. And so a trivial algebra, which is also a group, is nothing but the trivial group, whose only element is the identity element. So rigid is a word which is used in combinatorics and in algebra. Um, the specific definition varies. Obviously here I will keep to the one that I just gave, but in a more general mathematical context, uh, rigid refers to objects like algebras or graphs or other things which have uh, very few symmetries in some sense. And again, the particular sense is something which needs to be made clear in the specific context. But in our case, an algebra is rigid when it has no automorphisms other than the trivial one, which it always has. Okay, so now we can uh, move on to talk about subalgebras and their corresponding subuniverses. Using our new notation, we have a slightly cleaner definition for subalgebra as well, which is again, basically the definition we already gave, except now instead of referring to some index set i and some little i in that index set, we now refer to an operation symbol f of some specified arity so that, uh, for example, uh, for subalgebras, we say that B is a subalgebra of A when its universe is a subset of the universe of A. And given any little f of arity n, we have that the interpretation of that little f in B is nothing but the basic operation corresponding to f in A, restricted to those tuples whose entries all come from B. And so again, this new notation makes it a little clearer uh, that we want to think of F in A and F in B in the same light, even though they're not literally the same operation. 
So we'll often want to intersect two subalgebras in order to obtain another subalgebra. I won't go too much into why we're going to do this because we're not quite there yet, but uh, remember that when I gave an example of um, one of the first uh, things that was done in lattice theory, Dedekind's work on lattices whose elements were subgroups of a given abelian group, uh, the operation of meet there was actually the intersection of subgroups. And so uh, that's a little bit of a, a hint as to what we might be doing intersecting subalgebras in the future. Um, however, uh, according to our strict definition, there is a big difference between a subalgebra and its universe. A subalgebra is an algebra, a universe is just some set universe of a particular algebra, perhaps. So in elementary group theory or ring theory, the distinction between, um, for example, a group G, which we might write like this, as having a universe and then some basic, um, some basic operations like this, there isn't much distinction made in elementary treatments uh, between the group, which is this whole algebraic structure and just the underlying set G. And so then a uh, careful distinction is also not made between subgroups, which are subalgebras of this group, and subsets, which are universes of those subalgebras. And so in order to help us keep better track of what we're doing, since it's now a little bit more abstract, we're going to be very careful to continue that distinction as we've continued it when talking about algebras so far. We are very careful not to confuse the set A with an algebra A whose universe is the set A. Okay, so what is a subuniverse? As you may have already read on the page here, and as I have already hinted, if we have an algebra A and some set B, which is a subset of its universe, we say that uh, B is a subuniverse of the algebra A when that set B is the universe of a subalgebra, bold B of A. So a subuniverse is nothing other than the universe of a subalgebra of the particular algebra in question. So uh, the collection of all subuniverses of an algebra is denoted by sub A. And we always have the A as in sub A because uh, every algebra is a subalgebra of itself. And as before, uh, there's actually an algebraic structure and you already might be able to guess what it is, which we can put on the subuniverses of the algebra A. However, we're going to wait until a future date to do that. Now, I want to make a brief digression about empty algebras. So we say that an algebra whose universe is the empty set is an empty algebra. That is, we have our universe is the empty set, and we have some collection of basic operations f, where one of these operations would be a function from empty set to the n to the empty set. And let's first consider the case where n is actually a natural number. In other words, where n is not zero. So in that case, we actually have that this set is the collection of all tuples, n tuples whose elements come from the empty set, but you can't make such an n tuple. And so this is actually just the empty set again for the domain. You can also think of it as being the collection of all functions from the set one, two, three, up to n to the empty set. However, there are no such functions because we can't have a function from a non-empty set to an empty set. So this n -ary basic operation must be a function from the empty set to itself, but there's only one such function, which is the one we call the empty function and we talked about before. Okay, so n -ary operations on the empty set are pretty restricted. There aren't a lot of choices for them. 
Now, it actually happens that an empty algebra can only have this signature row taking basic operations symbols to the whole numbers when there are no null area or constant basic operation symbols. So the reason for that is the following. How could we have a null area operation on the empty set? It would have to be a function from the empty set to the zeroth uh, Cartesian power to the empty set. However, there's only one, there's only one empty tuple whose elements come from the empty set, or in other words, there's only one function from the empty set to itself, this empty set to the zero can also be thought of as the set of all functions from the empty set to itself. There is one such function, the empty function. So this is actually this, so this constant operation f is actually a function whose domain is the set containing one element, the empty function, and whose codomain is the empty set. However, there is no function from a non-empty set, which this is, to the empty set, and so these cannot exist. It is for that reason that it is impossible to define a, an algebra whose universe is the empty set if you have constant or nullary operations in your signature. Otherwise, it is possible, and in fact, it is exceedingly easy because you don't have many choices. All right, so some authors don't even allow empty algebras, rendering this entire discussion moot for them. Uh, the debate on whether uh, we should accept or reject empty algebras in our definition of an algebra um, is mostly beyond the scope of this lecture. Uh, it gets into some things that I really don't think are appropriate to address yet in an elementary universal algebra and lattice theory lecture series. Uh, so we're, um, we're not going to get into why, but uh, in this lecture series, the empty algebra will be a, a valid and accepted algebraic structure, although as we've seen, they don't always exist, depending on what the signature is. So uh, note then that the empty set is a subuniverse of any algebra whose basic operations contain no null area operations because if your signature does have empty algebras, in other words, if you have no null area operations, then uh, it's quite easy for the empty algebra to be a subalgebra of any algebra. Since its universe is the empty set, that empty set is a subuniverse of any of those algebras. All right. Now let's move on to the third of our basic concepts for today, products. So just as we did with homomorphisms and subalgebras, we can also rewrite our definition of products using our new notation. And so uh, as we can see here, the definition is very similar. We have a sequence of algebras AJ indexed on some set J, and each of those algebras is assumed to be of the same similarity type, each having its own interpretation of the basic operations or the basic operation symbols in this collection F of basic operation symbols. So when we go to define this product, we take our universe to consist of all the elements of this big Cartesian product of sets, or in other words, sequences indexed on the elements of J of the elements of the AJ. We can take the product of n of those sequences under some n area operation f by performing the corresponding operations f a j component wise and so we'll see examples of this in a second but this is the formal definition of the general case which you can look over more closely in the notes to make sure that you understand the totally general case so Let's just consider finite direct products first, although again, that was the correct general formal definition, now with some of the indices eliminated. Uh, 
So when our product is actually indexed over the set j, which is 1, 2, up through k for some natural number k, we actually write a1 cross a2 cross blah, 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 cross ak uh, instead of, instead of uh, this, this big direct product notation. And so that should be familiar from elementary group theory or ring theory. Uh, in this case, we can think of elements uh, of the product as tuples, where a1, a2, up through ak, where the aj belong to the set, the universe of the algebra aj. And so we can, of course, think of the general case this way as well, but it's much easier to write down a finite sequence than it is to write down an infinite sequence, especially if the sequence in question is uncountably infinite. Okay, so in the simplest non-trivial case, we can take the direct product A1 cross A2 of just two different algebras. Given an operation symbol, little f of arity n, we can then define the operation f on the direct product by applying it, applying the corresponding operations FA1 and FA2 to the first and second components respectively. That is, if I want to take this collection of n pairs, each of whose first element comes from A1 and each of whose second element comes from A2, I can do that by forming a new pair. The first element of the new pair is what I get by combining a11, A21, up through An1, according to FA1. And the second coordinate is what I get by combining A12, A22, up through An2, uh, according to the operation F in A2. And the more general definition for larger finite or even infinite <laughs> direct products is very much analogous to this. We can also consider the special case where all of the algebras AI are actually the same algebra A, no matter which little i we take in our index set i. We call A to the i the ith direct power of the algebra A. We can think of elements of A to the i as functions from the set i to the set A. Indeed, they are <laughs> formally, and we can certainly think of them that way. The operations of A to the I at component-wise on these functions according to our previous definition. And so for an even more special case, if our index set I is the set 1, 2, up through K for some natural number K, then we write A to the K rather than A to the I. We write A to the 0 rather than A to the empty set. I'm not going to do it right now, but you should convince yourself that a to the zero is a trivial algebra, not an empty algebra. Remember the distinction. Empty algebras have no elements in their universes. They have empty universes. Trivial algebras have a single element in their universe. So a to the zero is a trivial algebra for any a. And also, you should be able to show that a to the one is actually isomorphic to the original algebra A that you started with, although perhaps not literally equal. So there's actually a familiar example that you have seen in calculus courses or in more elementary mathematics, which is the ring of real functions where I take the ring of real numbers and then I form the, the R, the real number, Cartesian or direct power of that ring of real numbers. So if I have, uh, so then the universe of this algebra is actually, is actually the set of all functions from R to itself. And so elements F and G in this set are functions like F from R to R, where say, for example, F of X could be e to the x. And maybe for another example, we could have a g mapping r to r, where g of x is defined to be x plus 2. Then 
if I want to say multiply f and g in this or in this direct power ring, then fg of x, since we're doing operations component-wise, each real number x corresponds to a component. And so fg of x, according to our general definition, should be no nothing other than f of x times g of x for any x. And so this would be e to the x times x plus 2. We can similarly add component-wise or take the additive inverse of a function component-wise. Note that's not the same as taking the inverse function. In any case, this uncountably infinite <laughs> direct power is actually an algebra that you've already worked with a lot. And so uh, direct powers, although they might sound very large, and indeed uh, cardinality-wise, this algebra is pretty large, um, they don't really have to be such alien things. You've already seen them in <laughs> real life, so to speak. Okay. Now let's sum things up by talking about the class operators H, S, and P. As we progress in our study of universal algebra, we will often be concerned with the following three operators, which produce new classes of algebras from old ones, which is why I said class operators. So if we're given a class K of similar algebras, that is, if I have two different algebras in that class K, they must be similar to each other. So I could do things like take the direct product or talk about homomorphisms and so forth. So if I have a class K of similar algebras, I'm going to say that H of K, old H of K, if you're uh, picky about notation, is the class of all homomorphic images of members of K. Uh, S of K is the class of all algebras which are isomorphic to a subalgebra of a member of K. That is, members of S of K don't have to actually be subalgebras of a member of K. They just have to be isomorphic to subalgebras of a member of K. And similarly, P of K is the class of all algebras which are isomorphic to a direct product of members of K. And remember that direct product in our context can mean any index set on the direct product. So not just of two algebras, but of as many uncountably infinite algebras as you like, or zero is also acceptable, or one. <laughs> okay. So we have these three operators. And I would like to note that H, S, and P are defined so that each of the classes H of K, S of K, and P of K are closed under isomorphic images, no matter what K is. That is, if I choose any algebra in say H of K, and then I look at another algebra which is isomorphic to it, that algebra must be in H of K already. And similarly for S of K and P of K. So this is gonna save us a lot of headache later because most of what we discuss will actually be the same for two algebras uh, if those algebras are isomorphic. And this is an idea which should already be familiar for more elementary algebra uh, that I don't really want to distinguish between two isomorphic algebraic structures when I'm just talking about purely algebraic properties. It shouldn't matter whether I think of a complex number as an element of some extension or as a matrix, it's going to still have the same algebraic properties. Okay, so if I have any operator O, which could, for example, be H or S or P, which takes some classes of similar algebras to other classes of algebras, then we'll say that a class K is closed under that operator or with respect to that operator O when O of K is a subclass of the class K. Or in other words, when every member of O of K is also a member of the original class K. Now, a variety is defined to be nothing but a class of similar algebras, K, which is closed under these three basic operators. Uh, the homomorphism operator, or homomorphic images, uh, subalgebras, 
and products. So universal algebra was actually initiated as a discipline during the 1930s. Uh, it wasn't until the 1970s that the subject really began to increasingly focus on varieties of algebras. And this is actually uh, part of the reason that I said in a previous lecture that universal algebra isn't literally only just ever the study of varieties of algebras and their properties, although that has become an increasingly big part of it. Uh, that wasn't even the definite focus of the subject until uh, some decades after its initiation. Um, and our treatment will parallel this development. So earlier on, we're going to focus more on properties associated to a single algebra or a couple of algebras. And as we progress, we'll see more and more results which actually deal with these particular classes of algebras sort of all together simultaneously. Now let's move on to our final topic, which is generating subalgebras. We said previously that we defined subuniverses so that we could take intersections of subalgebras. Uh, then this following proposition moves us in that direction. So if I have an algebra A and a collection of subuniverses S of that algebra A, the intersection of those subuniverses is actually a subuniverse of the algebra A. And so uh, to give you an idea of why this is the case, if I have, say, my algebra A is an algebra with the universe A and some basic operation symbols F interpreted there, then if I fix some F in my collection of operation symbols and I fix uh, the arity of that to be N, well, I can uh, consider any, let's take any S in my fancy, oh, that's not very fancy, <laughs> okay. Let's, let's, let's not do that. Let's fix any B in my collection of subuniverses S, uh, since fancy S is giving me a little trouble right now. And then notice that since B itself is a subuniverse, then if I take any um, A1 da, 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 through AN in B, well then, because B is a subuniverse, because S is a collection of subuniverses, then F of A1 through AN is also in B. But then if it happens that these guys are not just in, in B, but are actually in the intersection of the collection S, that means these guys are in B for any B in that collection of subuniverses. And so F of A1 through AN is actually in that particular B for any particular B in that collection of subuniverses S. And so actually this guy is in the intersection of all of those sets because it's, it's in each of them. Okay, so that's kind of an idea of the proof of this statement. And so, um, so then, we'd see, then we'd see that, that uh, if I take any n things in the intersection, that if I apply f in the algebra A to them, I get something else which is also in the intersection. Now, uh, we'd like to use this to consider the smallest subuniverse containing some specified elements of an algebra. So if I fix some algebra A and take some subset X of A, which doesn't have to be a subuniverse, just any subset of the universe of A, then we define the subuniverse of A generated by this set to be, uh, well, denoted by this notation, subuniverse generated by uh, X in the algebra A. And we say that this is the intersection 
of all of the subuniverses of A, which contain X as a subset. So the previous proposition actually tells us that uh, the subuniverse generated by a set X is indeed a subuniverse of A. Notice that uh, the subuniverse generated by X in A must contain X. Now, the reason for this is that, uh, while certainly X is a subset of A, but A itself is a subuniverse. And so the subuniverse generated by, by X must be obtained by intersecting this set A with more sets, which also contain X as a subset by definition. And so uh, no amount of intersection there can ever throw away an element of X. And so we at least have X in the subuniverse generated by X, which is good because we'd like to think of that as the smallest <laughs> subalgebra or subuniverse containing the set X. Okay. So instead of taking this top-down viewpoint, so this top-down viewpoint would be like, okay, we have this set X, and then we're gonna look at all the different subuniverses. Maybe this is a subuniverse. Maybe this is another subuniverse. Maybe this is a subuniverse. We're gonna look at all of those subuniverses which contain X, and we're gonna intersect them until we get just the smallest subuniverse that contains X. We had defined that as the subuniverse generated by X. However, there's also a bottom-up approach where we say, okay, maybe, you know, maybe we do all this and we eventually get this, this, this square is our subuniverse generated by X. What we can do instead is we can say, okay, well, if I wanted to make this subuniverse generated by X, here's X sitting inside of here maybe I can actually somehow build up this subuniverse by looking at bigger and bigger sets that contain X and sort of iteratively build up the subuniverse generated by X. That's the bottom up approach that we'll describe now. So if we have an algebra A and some subset X of A, we can start off defining our first set to be X and then for each natural number n, or, sorry, our zero set x naught to be x. And then for each natural number n, we're going to define xn to be the previous one, along with all of the elements we can make where we take, we take a bunch of things in the previous level and combine them again, together according to a basic operation in our algebra. So this F again, although I'll stop writing the superscripts eventually, this is F in the algebra A. But then of course, F by itself can also just be a basic operation symbol. And so eventually we get pretty lazy about that, just as we do in group theory or ring theory, and we stop writing the superscript when it's not necessary. Okay, so in any case, what we do in order to iteratively build up the subalgebra generated by a set is at each stage, we take the previous stage and we add in all of those new elements that we can make by combining together old elements using one of the basic operations of our algebra. And it turns out <laughs> that the subalgebra generated by X and A is actually the union over all whole numbers of these sets Xn. So, that's not entirely obvious by any means, and I will describe how to prove it. That this top down and this bottom up approach are actually the same. So let's let Y be the union over all whole numbers of the sets Xn that we built up iteratively using the basic operations of the algebra A. It suffices to show that the subalgebra generated by X is contained in Y and that y is contained in the subalgebra generated by x. In order to show that the subalgebra is, or that the subuniverse, excuse me, that the subuniverse um, generated by x is contained in y, we can show that y is the subuniverse of a uh, containing x, but that's actually evident from the construction of y. 
because if we took some collection of elements in Y, there would be some XN for some particular N that they were all contained in, and then applying the uh, any basic operation to those that collection, uh, we would get an element of one of the xn for perhaps a different value of n. Okay, so uh, it is the case that the subuniverse generated by x is contained in y. And on the other hand, if we want to show that y is contained in the subuniverse generated by x, we can use an induction argument in order to show that each of the xn are contained um, in the subuniverse generated by x. And so, uh, and so then the idea here is that certainly x is contained in the subuniverse <laughs> generated by x because it's in every subuniverse which contains it. And then if I know that xn minus one is contained in the subuniverse generated by X. Well, that subuniverse generated by X is a subuniverse, so it's closed under the operations, and that allows me to form S X n plus one and know that it's still in it's still in my subuniverse generated by X. So that's just a sketch, but you can look at the details more in the recommended text if you would like. Now, a consequence of this result is that if I have any element A in the sub-universe generated by X, then there's some finite subset of that generating set X so that A is in the sub-universe generated by that finite subset. And that actually makes sense intuitively because an element of the sub-universe generated by X, uh, okay, what is A going to have to look like? Basically, it looks like um, maybe some F1 of F2 of blah, 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 combined with F3 of blah, blah, blah. It's basically going to look like some composite of basic operations with um, applied to elements of your algebra. And so there can only be finitely many elements and finitely many operations. To do this properly takes a little bit of an induction argument, but basically the idea is that A must be able to be written as some finite expression involving elements of your, of your set X and basic operations of your algebra. Yeah, so like these, whatever these elements are actually have to all belong to X. It's really not A1, but like X1 and some X2 and so forth. So that's also just some intuition, but that's the idea. Okay, and so uh, finally we say that an algebra A is finitely generated when there's actually some finite subset of that algebra so that the entire universe is the subuniverse generated by that finite subset. And this generalizes the idea of a group or a ring or a module being finitely generated, and we'll have a lot more to say about that later, but at this point I will let you go. And again, thank you for another scintillating day of universal algebra and more lattice theory to be coming soon. Thank you.